I would like to introduce the others up here at the head table. At stage left is Rick Sternbach, our RS guest of honor. Next to him, applause later please for the whole group. Next to him is his wife, Asenath Hammond Sternbach. Next to her is Ted Sturgeon's wife, Lady Jane Sturgeon. Ted Sturgeon, I'll get to in a moment. <laughs> On my right, Tom Digby. Next to him is outgoing men's staff president, Nate Buckland. And to Nate's right is Neaters. Okay, now we get to Ted Sturgeon. It, yes, it wasn't, in, it wasn't until two weeks ago that I met Theodore Sturgeon. I'd read his books and marveled at him. His short stories were nothing less than great. His novel, More Than Human, had won the very first International Fantasy Award in 1954. Following that same theme in More Than Human is the novel, The Cosmic Rape. His ideas of group mind, the gestalt, are perhaps the best use of this theme in science fiction. Most others could have been content with writing novels like those and just let it rest on his laurels. But Theodore Sturgeon has also produced some of the finest short fiction in science fiction. Microcosmic God is an acknowledged classic. It is one of the Science Fiction Writers of America Hall of Fame selections. But my favorite story of his is his 1970 Hugo and Nebula Award winning story, Slow Sculpture. Some three decades had passed between Microcosmic God and Slow Sculpture. Nine years later, Theodore Sturgeon is still writing tremendous stories. How has he managed to keep appeal for so long? One obvious reason is his writing skill. Brian Ash in Visual Encyclopedia of Science Fiction wrote, There has always been a small group of science fiction writers, among them Ray Bradbury and Theodore Sturgeon, who have shown concern for the literary standards of the genre. I think this is extremely apparent in Theodore Sturgeon's work. He is a stylist. He knows how to use the English language. He takes care with his stories. Another reason for his popularity is his willingness to explore forbidden territory. In science fiction, nothing should be forbidden to us. Any theme should be fair game. It's not always this way. Only a very few have the courage and the nerve to pioneer new territory for lesser writers. Venus plus X, and if all men were brothers, would you let one marry your sister, had sexual themes, but dealt with them in a restrained and balanced manner that truly makes them landmarks in science fiction rather than tawdry sensationalism. Those are obvious reasons for Theodore Sturgeon's popularity. But talking with the man makes the answer even more apparent. He's both human and humane. He's a philosopher. He examines both himself and the people around him. His interests encompass anything and everything dealing with people. Theodore Sturgeon's stories aren't concerned so much with the mechanical objects as they are with the emotions, human aspirations, human failings, human successes. Protons and spaceships are less vital to his stories than loneliness, love, grief, emotional and psych psychological survival in society. Technology changes with dazzling swift swiftness. Humans change much more gradually. Theodore Sturgeon knows this and explores it in his fiction. What better choice could many con have made for Guest of Honor than Theodore Sturgeon? Fans, it's my great pleasure to present Mr. Theodore Sturgeon. My gosh, how can I follow an act like that? Before I begin my perorations here, I have to share with you one of the absolute peak experiences of my life. Lady Jane and I went up to the Jupiter encounter a few weeks ago at JPL, and it was really incredible. Monday morning, three, four o'clock in the morning, the pictures began coming in every two, three minutes, and uh, it was simply stupefying to see these pictures and later the, the computerized color renditions of these pictures. At one of these, I remember Lady Jane said, you know something? Rick Sternbach did it better. <laughs> we looked upon Ganymede and Callisto and Amalthea, which is kind of a baked potato that goes around in the way inside near Jupiter, always with one point toward the planet. It's not big enough to be round. And Callisto, and on Callisto, is the mark of a cloven hoof. 
And the rumor went around that it was Dr. Walter Sullivan who had stamped on it. Rick Sternbach's lady, Asenoth, was heard to say, oh no, it wasn't Walter Sullivan. It was an IOU. I have a word to say about Digby. And Digby, I'm going to say this publicly. You are a better poet than Ray Bradbury. <laughs> I hardly know where to begin. I begin with Easter. It's a time for profound thoughts about out there and so on. It says in the good book, in the beginning was the word, which is something that most television producers have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and the word was God, and the word was with God. And I've been ruminating on that one. It says essentially, if you look at it, that God is what he says he is. You match that against some other things that you have heard, and it's wonderful how these things cycle around on themselves and come back to it. Thou art God. You are what you say you are. What you say in any of the many vocabularies you have, not only speech. As a fairly practiced wordsmith, I have got to say that words are not the best means of communication, and they need all the help they can get. And to the seeing eye, they do get a lot of help. They get it in body language, they get it in attitudes, they get it in actions before the fact and after the fact. These are communications that we get one to the other. This convention is more or less has a theme, the other 10%. And the fact that we in science fiction are in the upper 10% of humanity, of course, there's no argument about that. <laughs> Sturgeon's Law says, that um, the reason that science fiction is 90% of it is crud is that 90% of everything is crud. Now that everything is a big word, and people with tongues in their cheeks might point out that uh, everything probably includes the people in science fiction too. Well, I'd like to clear that up for you. <laughs> I really would. As a matter of fact, it applies to the people in this room too. In this, on this planet, there are some four billion human souls. And there are, therefore, four billion universes. I happen to be the center of the universe, and all things are orbital around me, because that is my point of view. But it is also yours, and yours, and yours, all over, world without end, literally without end. Now, of these four billion universes, 90% of them are crud. Okay? <laughs> of the contents of each universe, 90% of it is crud. For every human soul who is around, 90% of him is crud. Why should that be? That seems basically unfair. That's a rather profound imbalance. Well, I think that it's explained this way pretty much. We're conditioned not to believe in our own uniqueness. We are conditioned not to accept our own excellence. There are really and truly a few people who can accept a compliment and who know their excellence, who can concede to the world that they're very good at something. Sometimes the thing they are very good at is being exactly what they are. Wherever you see people making a posture that they are something other than what they really are, you're seeing the manifestation of the crud. When you meet one of these very few people who is absolutely upfront and who does not came play games with other people, uh, not the one who, can, who must be frank and always precede it with the word brutally, I don't mean that, but the person who is absolutely and wholly and totally what he is and presents himself as such. It isn't what he owns, it isn't where he's been to school, it isn't where his family came from, it isn't his race, it isn't his color, it's simply what he is. He knows what he is through and through. He recognizes that he's unique. 
and himself, and the great expert of all time on being exactly what he is, because he never happened before, and he is never going to happen again. The he, of course, is one of those categorical things. She also. Therefore, he, that person, is the upper 10% and unique and the elite, if you like. And in all these universes, these four billion universes, lives that one person who is unique and who is himself. Sometimes it's hard to glimpse him because he's been conditioned to play games and to hide himself and to say what he owns is himself instead of what he is is himself. But down underneath all of that, in each of these four billion universes, is that real person. And I love him. And that's what I write about, because I know that it's inside everyone. And so 90% of everything is crud. You can take that easily, knowing that you are really and truly the other 10%. How I got here in this particular way of thinking is through this symbol that you see dangling on me, and you see it on everything I autograph. It's the letter Q with an arrow through it. And it means ask the next question. And the one that follows, and the one that follows that, and the one that follows that. You ask the one that follows that on the basis of the question that you've just asked. It isn't ask always or ask anything. It's ask that next question sequentially from the one you've asked before. It's the symbol of everything that humanity has ever accomplished. It is the reason humanity has accomplished anything at all. A man sits in a cave and says, why can't men fly? Well, the answer to the question is how, which is a question. And the answer to that might not help him any, but today men fly. It's a symbol that will take you through some very difficult country. How many times have you heard somebody say, don't tell me, I don't want to know that. As soon as he said that, he died and then joined the ranks of the zombies you see walking around who have stopped. It's the symbol of everything that is ongoing and life-directed and welcoming change and growth and evolution. It's the ultimate natural symbol. If you follow it, and if you followed it to its absolute ultimate, you would come to something called basic truth. And when you got there, you would not find a thing. You would find a process, something moving. Something moving. I have, as you probably know, investigated the aspects of love, all the aspects of love, and how it's expressed and all the possible ways it can be expressed, at least that I can find out about. <coughs> Excuse me. And I find that there's only one thing that I call an unnatural practice. All the rest are natural in one way or the other. The one unnatural practice is to stop. And only human beings of everything in the cosmos thinks it can stop. It always fails. It builds thousand-year racks. It builds everlasting pyramids. It says in its magazines, diamonds are forever. I got news for you. They're not. This planet began as a cloud of coalescing gases. It's going to end as some sort of a cinder. We stand on an island of granite, a fl afloat on a sea of hot mush, on a planet which is circling around its primary, which is circling around the galactic core, and a galaxy which is like other galaxies, boiling around like bran flakes in boiling water, and all kinds of stuff going on in between them. Everything is moving, and yet human beings are capable of saying, stop, this is forever, this is security, I'm sound, I'm, no, I will be goal-oriented, I will build a pyramid. Okay, build your pyramid out of your life, and when you're 62, in 18 months you'll be dead of boredom, because you have committed an unnatural practice. The only way to live, I think, and the only way to think, is another kind of stability, which is the stability of a goal in flight. It must be in motion in order to remain aloft. And that's kind of nice because it can adjust immediately to changes in crosswinds and humidity, temperature. That is a living, moving way of being stable. And so all I can ask of anybody, of any writer, of any builder, of any architect, any artist, is to move, is to keep moving, is to keep learning, and to keep asking the next question. I have no question to ask of Minicon. You, you have made me so welcome and so comfortable, and you've been so incredibly generous. Um, 
I mean, I hardly know how to say thanks. I want to express special thanks to that committee of yours who have been absolutely extraordinary, and all the people who have been working with them, the security and, and uh, the people in the arts and the, and the hucksters and so on. It's, uh, as Bob Tucker says, it's been smooth, right? <laughs> Thank you.